it seemed like it would never arrive. But here we are at the closure of the ninth Pokemon generation. And I think many of us would agree that although our time at the Blueberry Academy has been genuinely cool, the resolution of the Area Zero storyline has been, at the very least, disappointing. No connection with the Masks or Ogapon's human, no trace of Jack, Gita is even more useless than in the base game, Briar simply shouldn't be in charge of children, Kieran only had a tantrum, no explanation of the game symbols. It's as if there's not a single surprise in the entire final part, and, well, I think it wasn't what we expected, nor does it provide a satisfying conclusion to this long year in Paldea. Having the final plot twist of your games be that there is no plot twist is a tremendous punch in the face. Although, well, there's one thing that has been consistent since the base game, the Crystal Apocalypse. While it's true that it hasn't assumed the protagonistic role it deserved in concluding the Area Zero storyline, it's not just that the pieces are still there, Game Freak has even reinforced them in both DLCs. So, yes, the Pokémon world is still in danger, threatened by the growth of crystals that absorb energy. And now, it's all Briar's fault. Heath's descendant has condemned us all. Firstly, let's examine the points I got right in the Crystal Apocalypse video. The first one, although not confirmed 100%, is that Terrapagos comes from space. I believe there are several indicators in this direction in the second DLC, but perhaps the most powerful one is the name of the type created when Terrapagos' energy is at its maximum level, stellar type, related to the stars. Also, Heath's sketch itself seemed to be located in space, and Terrapagos' signature move is Terra Star Storm, essentially a shower of shooting stars. Even down there in the secret room of this new Area Zero zone, we find the TM for Meteor Beam, which, aside from clearly referencing a meteorite, charges cosmic energy when used. So, right from the start, I guess that's a small point for me, right? I mean, it can't be said to be canon, but I would say it's almost certain that Terrapagos came from space, most likely inside a meteor. But more importantly than that, I was correct about the general idea proposed in that video, how terrestal energy works and its relationship with Terrapagos. I was also right about Terrapagos being in some kind of dormant state, perhaps causing the outbreaks of Terra energy from the crater, although they are not mentioned again. I also correctly predicted that it could absorb energy, and indeed it clearly demonstrates this during its battle, absorbing the energy from our terrestalization to regenerate its Terra shield. And well, it did need that extra boost of terrestal energy from a Terra orb to reach its final form. We also got the key point on which the theory was based, Terrapagos' energy was what caused the crystals to spread. We'll explore this in more detail throughout the video, but it's clearly shown in the Area Zero Underdepths, where with each level we descend, there's more and more crystallization, ending up with almost everything completely covered in crystals. In fact, this leads us to another correct prediction, that both Terra energy and crystals become more persistent the more concentrated the turtle's energy is. Although again, we'll see this throughout the video, Briar herself comments in the cave that due to the high saturation of Terra energy in the environment, it remains crystallized as we had mentioned. We also correctly predicted that Terra shards were an indicator of the level of crystallization in a certain place. And again, we'll see it reinforced during the video. It's not a coincidence that around Zero Lab, we find Terra shards in batches of one or three, while in the underdepths we find them in batches of 10 to 30. And I think that's all. It's true, there are some things I didn't get right. Initially, I was more against than in favor of the imagination theory, but they got me with the legendary paradox beasts. And then, there were other things that Game Freak completely ignored in the DLCs, like the supposed Area Zero barrier, the increasingly powerful energy emissions, the black crystals, and although it's true that in the end, Terrapagos doesn't seem inherently evil, as was the case with Eternatus, hey, we have a cool moment when it transforms into its stellar form, and its energy seems unleashed, even trying to attack Kieran. And Briar says it's emitting Terra energy alarmingly, and if we don't stop it soon, we'll be in danger. You don't need to give it too much thought to see the danger of having a crazy crystallized energy emitter on the loose in Paldea. So in the end, despite certain details, my video was technically correct, the best kind of correct. And in fact, that's precisely what has been shown in both DLCs and what we'll explore further in this second part. That indeed, Terra energy could pose a threat to the entire Pokemon world. Kitakami was a great surprise for everyone. Instead of being an isolated story in Japan where there was no sign of Terra stylization, it had everything. Terra raids, glowing Pokemon, Terra shards, despite lacking any kind of Area Zero underneath. How could this be? Well, as we predicted, these crystals can spread, and despite not having an Area Zero, 
we have a crystal pool. The crystal pool is arguably the most important location in all of Kitakami. It's not for nothing that it was one of the symbols in the DLC's logo, and the inhabitants consider it a sacred place. A mysterious lake at the top of a mountain with an ogre face, where we can find large shiny crystals at its bottom. These crystals are clearly crystals with Terra energy, as Briar herself confirms by saying that the water of the crystal pool has a wavelength identical to that of terrestrial energy thanks to those same crystals. But then, how did they end up at Poke Japan? Well, we may find Crystal Pool's origin in the true story of the Loyal Three and the Ogre. Putting aside everything I mentioned in my video about Kitakami's hidden legendary, since in the end Game Freak got scared of success and decided that Petrarunt would not be part of Area Zero's story, what really matters from that legend are the human and the crystals with which the masks were crafted. As you may already know, Ogrepon's masks contain crystals that the human brought from his homeland, and these crystals are precisely what allow it to terrestrialize and even change types simply by wearing them. This, for now, aligns with what we had already seen in the base games. In the end, the masks, by having terra crystals, act as if they were some kind of primitive terra orbs, and the type change is likely due to the terra crystals used in each mask being of a specific type, as we had already seen with the different types of terra shards. What's really curious is that Ogapon can change types even before terrestrializing, if we put all this together, considering that the human brought the crystals from his homeland, and that it was supposed to be the only place in the world where terrestrialization could occur, especially knowing that it's exclusive to Terrapagos's energy, Paldea is almost certainly the human's native region. But of course this not only explains why Ogapon can terrestrialize with its mask-shaped orbs, it probably also explains the origin of the crystal pool. It's not a coincidence that to fix one of Ogrepon's masks, we precisely need a few crystals from its bottom. That's why I believe those crystals, given that it's said they were brought from distant lands long ago, also belong to Ogrepon's human. In the end, especially in that era, the arrival of two different people with crystals from a place no one or very few could access to, it's at least kind of unlikely, almost impossible. But there would still be another question. How did the crystals end up at the bottom of the lake? Why would the human want to create a lake with these characteristics? Well, I think there are two options. But in neither of them is it because he wanted to create something like that. The last thing we know about the human's final moments is that Ogrepon couldn't find him and went out searching for him, causing the tragic end of the Loyal Three. This opens up two possibilities. The first one is that the Loyal Three only stole the masks from the human and didn't kill him. After losing the fight, he fled in fear, throwing the rest of his crystals to the bottom of the lake near their cave to hide them from the thieves. And the second one is that if the Loyal Three did indeed kill the human, being only interested in the masks, as they were the only thing Pecharund instructed them to steal, they could have thrown the human's corpse to the bottom of the lake, sinking with him the remaining crystals not used in the creation of the masks. This would lead to hundreds of years in which those terra crystals would be behaving as we predicted, absorbing energy from their surroundings to grow, probably boosted by the fact that Oni Mountain is a dormant volcano, as hinted by the sulfur smell of the place and its shape. Moreover, it's not just that these crystals expanded until they reached their current size, but also that they were growing in a lake whose waters bathed the entire Kitakami region, causing terrestrial energy to spread throughout the area, resulting in terra shards, glowing Pokémon, and terra raid crystals, despite the absence of any legendary disc or Area Zero nearby. But we are also told that despite its characteristic faint glow, the lake's water is drinkable. In fact, it's used to supply the village. So, not only do the people in the village drink water with terrestrial energy, but also all the rice fields and crops are being irrigated with this hypervitaminized water, explaining why the Loyal Three, when they ate the well-spiced mochis, grew in size. They are like their own version of Herba Mystica, but with rice. This also fits with what we discussed about the Herba Mystica sandwiches, which, again, aligned with what we had seen with food containing Eternatus's energy. As you can see, Kitakami follows and confirms everything I said about how terrestrial energy works and how it spreads, and goes even further, showing what happens when you bring a crystal with terra energy to a place where there was none before. It expands and, by absorbing energy from its surroundings, gradually grows and fills everything with crystals, while also affecting local fauna and flora. And it could have ended there, in a remote region of Poke Japan, but Briar, blinded by her need to prove that her ancestor was not lying, and to recreate terrestrialization outside of Paldea, thanks to her discoveries in Kitakami, has condemned Unova too. Remember that Briar wasn't allowed to go to Area Zero to investigate, so our trip to Kitakami was the only possible way for her to obtain this information. And with it, Terra Power. 
And that's how Briar leads us and the Terrestalization to the second DLC, to Unova, creating what she has named as the Terrarium Core. This core kind of works as a large Terra energy sun, and it's what allows Terrestalization to be possible at the Blueberry Academy, again far from Area Zero thanks to the liquid inside it, composed of Paldea soil and crystal pool water, something they never publicly stated, probably to avoid conflicts with both regions. No wonder why they didn't let this crazy woman into Area Zero. The Terra energy emitted by Briar's core is what causes glowing Pokémon, Terra shards, and Terra raid crystals to appear in the terrarium, as confirmed by Cyrano himself. It's funny how Cyrano brags about it as going beyond Paldea because they have developed technology that allows them to control terrestalization and blah blah blah. Come on. In Paldea, the professors created a pocket device that allows terrestalization outside of Area Zero, and all Briar has done is play around with mixing Coke and Fanta at her little cousin's birthday party. I mean, she doesn't seem to have a clue about what she's causing. Anyway, let's continue. This invention has started an unstoppable chain reaction, because now the question is, for how long have they had that Terra light bulb on? Supposedly, the trip to Kitakami happens in the middle of our treasure hunt, and the study exchange should have been around the next academic year. So, at most, they have been radiating themselves with terrestrial energy for a handful of months, right? In fact, Lacey herself tells us that they were given their Terra Orbs not long ago. But then, this implies that the Blueberry Academy is at a much more accelerated crystallization point than the other regions in just a few months. Remember that in Paldea, in addition to having Area Zero emitting energy from time to time just below, it took at least 10 years of Terra Orb usage to have raid crystals on the surface, glowing Pokémon, and some Terra Shards in batches of 1 to 3. Remember this last bit because it will be important later on. If we review the state of Kitakami, we know that they have had crystals in the Crystal Pool for at least a few hundred years, distributing their energy thanks to the water, slower than in Paldea due to the absence of Terra Orbs, but causing the appearance of the same things. And again Terra Shards in quantities between 1 and 3, just like in Paldea. The point is that in both places where we had already seen terrestrial energy, we can find terra shards in small quantities, right? Well, in the terrarium, in just a few months, it's not only that terra raid crystals and glowing Pokémon have already appeared, the number of terra shards you can find is between 10 and 20 in one single batch. Moreover, they are all over the map. The amount of terra shards scattered per square meter is absurd compared to the other two regions. You can find more there than in the surroundings of Zero Lab. It's insane. But do you know which is the only area in the entire game where you can find more Terra Shards than in the Blueberry Academy? Yeah, there's only one. In the damn Area Zero Under Depths, where you find them in batches of 10 to 30. I mean, remember that down there is where Terrapagos is, more than one kilometer deep. And yet, the Blueberry Academy has almost the same level of terrestrialization on the surface. Well done, Briar. I'm sure this isn't bad at all. But what's also clear is that they are the ones causing this by abusing Terra Energy. Because if you take a look right below the platform where the Fire-type Elite Four battles take place, there are a ton of Fire Terra Shards. And such an exaggerated amount right below the only battle arena that is a platform isn't a random design choice. And although it's the most obvious case due to having an empty space beneath it, we can also find the significant amount of 19 Dragon Terra Shards near Drayton's Arena. Remember that those trainers have had the Terra Orbs in their hands for a very short time, as Lacey told us. That amount of Terra Shards, even below a place where battles are taking place all day long, it's not normal in such a short time. But this isn't the only effect of the huge amount of Terra energy Briar is radiating into the terrarium. Did you know that it's also triggering the growth of a new type of Herba Mystica? Amaris tells us that in the terrarium, there's a wild plant whose leaves have curious properties, and she uses them to create a supplement that enhances Pokémon's flying abilities. Whatever that means. But it isn't a coincidence that when our Coridon or Miraidon eat them, they have the exact same energy effect on them as the one from a Herba Mystica. It seems that Terra Radiation has caused some herbs in the area to acquire unique properties, exactly like what happened at Area Zero, something we hadn't seen on the surface of Paldea, and that would be even on a higher level than Kitakami's Mochis. Poor thing received such tremendous doping at the end of the DLC so that it could fly all the time, I think it now beeps in all airports. To sum up, what Briar has created is basically a damn greenhouse that is accumulating terrestrial energy like crazy in the enclosed and small space that is the Terrarium Dome. And on top of that, I think there's something else enhancing all that Terra energy. Do you remember that in Kitakami there was a dormant volcano? Well, in the Blueberry Academy, I would say it's all the cubes scattered throughout the biome. 
because no, these cubes aren't just for decoration. An NPC tells us that they emit infrared and ultraviolet rays that help plants and Pokemon grow, but everything seems to indicate that it's not the only thing they're doing, although they may not know it. The energy from those cubes, combined with being in a confined and closed place constantly irradiated with Terra energy, thanks to the core, makes the terrarium a place where the level of crystallization in the environment is only surpassed by the underdepths, the deepest zone of Area Zero, the epicenter of Terra energy. But that's not all, because Briar went a step further. The Stellar Terratype is the highest expression of Terra energy accumulation. In other words, it's basically all Terratypes in one. So much so, that it only existed in the underdepths, the closest area to the epicenter of this energy, Terrapagos, a being that is, as Briar tells us, pure terrestrial energy. This was the only place where this phenomenon manifested, until now. What a coincidence that because of Briar taking crystals from the underdepths and adding them to the core's cocktail, now there are also wild Pokémon with the stellar terratype in the terrarium, making the Blueberry Academy the only place on the entire surface with such a level of crystallization capable of replicating this phenomenon. In fact, as an example of another clue from Game Freak to show us this problem, when we learn about this, only a few days have passed since our adventure at Terrapagos' house, but we can already find 50 Stellar Terra shards on top of the terrarium's core. In a place where no one has battled and in just a few days, it's mind-blowing. It seems Briar unknowingly has done something bigger and more dangerous than giving the power of terrestalization to the Academy students. Furthermore, this DLC could have confirmed that all this crystallization poses a threat to the Pokémon world. Do you remember that one of my strongest arguments for worrying about the crystallization of Paldea was that the trees in the upper part of Area Zero were starting to crystallize, and there were shiny particles in the air too? Well, I think we may have found a confirmation of this problem in the Underdepths where we can find a fully crystallized tree. People had theorized, given the importance it seemed to have in the DLC trailer, that this tree could be the origin of Terra energy. But in the end, it has been confirmed that it comes entirely from Terrapagos. In fact, they didn't even share the same room. I believe that probably the intention here was to show the advantages and dangers of Terra energy by showing the final stage of what started to happen in the upper level of Area Zero to other trees. This tree is larger than the rest by a good chunk, but it's completely crystallized. This could lead us to understand that Terrapagos' energy has caused a tree seed to grow unnaturally more than a kilometer deep and bigger than other surface trees. Something similar to Calyrex's energy, but in return it has left it frozen in time, completely engulfed by crystals that, as we can notice, seem to take advantage of its life energy to emit more and more glittering particles. I think this is the confirmation that if we hadn't contained Terrapagos' energy when it transformed into its stellar form, we might have ended up witnessing a very different Paldea. It's a shame Briar seems to have made our efforts useless. Could this be the starting point for a new story in Unova if Game Freak decides to remake Pokémon Black and White? Will we need to prevent the crystallization of a region again? Or will it remain as another one of those threats that will never be resolved. Like the energy shortage in the 8th gen, or the resource scarcity in the 6th, it wouldn't be the first time we witness part of Unova covered by an external menace. Thank you very much for your time, and see you in the next video.